Okay, well, this is not going to be an academic talk. This is going to be a fun talk, okay? So if you wanted a lot of equations, you know, come, on, come some other time. <laughs> I can see some people don't want those. Okay, that's good. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about weather and how to be a good weather consumer. And what does it mean to be a good weather consumer? Well, you've got to know where to get reliable weather information, right? You need to know what's hype and what's real. And uh, I'm happy to talk about some of our local media and how they tend to hype things. <laughs> I can even talk about the Seattle Times if you want. Uh, it's good to know about the limits of weather prediction, how, you know, what can we do and what can't we do. And it's also useful to know how to read the sky and how to interpret basic weather information. And I'll try to cover a lot of that today. And then I'm going to leave plenty of time for questions, okay? Because questions are the fun part. So let me get past the, the most common question I'm, I'm asked in public talks. And what do you think that one is? <laughs> Can you believe the Farmer's Almanac? I can't, I, I want to get this out of the way now. <laughs> and what do you think the answer is? No, absolutely not. In fact, a UW NOAA individual, who's also a state climatologist, a close friend of mine, Nick Bond, did a very detailed study of, uh, of the uh, sk skill, if you want to call it that, of, uh, of the Farmer's Almanac, Old Farmer's Almanac. He found absolutely no skill. You're better off flipping you know, a coin or something. In fact, for precipitation, it was worse than flipping your coin, which is strangely enough a form of skill. <laughs> so where do you get weather information? Well, there's a few places you can look, of course. Well, there's print newspapers, and you know, uh, you know, that's not so good, really. Radio, generally not good except for KPLU on Friday at 9 o'clock. <laughs> uh, as I'm going to tell you, TV stations, the weather you get on TV, that varies substantially in quality. And uh, as you'll see, there's a difference between weekend and weekday weather, folks. Um, TV tends to hype quite a bit. Another thing you can do is get a NOAA weather radio. You can go on with these weather radios, you push a button, and that's, that's interesting. But as I'll talk about, the, probably the best way to get your weather data today is online, either on your desktop or through your smartphone. And smartphones, as I'm going to say, are, is the, are, they're the meteorological delivery system that we dreamed about, okay? So let's talk about it. Well, first, let me get this out of the way. Newspapers, bad place to get your weather information. I mean, it's the print especially. Uh, some of the times it's like days old, the forecast, right? So, you know, maybe you like the weather graphics, but this is not where I would turn. You know, these weather radios, I, I, I don't know if you, it's kind of old fashioned, but I don't know if you've ever seen them. You can buy these, for, you know, uh, for 20 bucks and uh, you, you can just push this button and you get the latest forecast. Well, the good thing about it is you can be in the middle of nowhere where there's no conductivity on your smartphone and you can still get the weather forecast. So these weather radios, they're a nice little gift that they also give it a wall, they have alarms. If there's a storm going on, they, they, they beep. So that's, it's, it's not a bad way. Um, and it's updated every few hours by the folks at the National Weather Service who make these broadcasts. Well, now let's get to the controversial part of the talk here. A little bit, talk a little bit about TV weather. And I hope everything I say, I say right now stays in this room, okay? <laughs> it's gonna be a lot like Las Vegas here or something. Um, first, the te people you see on TV, only about half of them are really meteorologists. And what I mean by a meteorologist is someone that has a degree, you know, who actually has an academic background, okay? The rest don't. And so I'm going to call those weathercasters, okay? So there's weathercasters and meteorologists. Some of the weathercasters call themselves meteorologists, but they're not. Um, talking about, one thing I want to stress is there's a difference between the weekday and the weekend TV folks, TV, TV weathercasters. The week Day people tend to be better, tend to have degrees. The weekend people tend to be weaker. And, you know, one of the, the, the evil pleasures of people in my field is we watch these, these weekend people and listen to them and they're pointing at the wrong thing and saying, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of amusing. <laughs> um, TV weather folks tend to follow the weather service or, a ma or major outlets like the Weather Channel very closely. 
they most of them don't really make their own forecasts. Okay. One way I know this is I a few years ago I did it a few times. I got I teach 101 once in a while, and I had them my students write down the forecasts for the various TV stations, and then I compared it against the weather service, and I found out that at least for the first few days there was no statistically significant difference between what the TV folks were saying and the weather service. Just tells you something. Then on the hand, you look at the, like the, the day eight forecast, you know, like some of them go way out in time, and God knows where they get them, because sometimes they're just, some of them are just crazy. There's a lot of hype on TV weather, okay? And they have some of the funniest names, like you know, the Pinpoint Severe Weather Center, you know? The Doppler Radar Weather Center. I mean, this is just crazy stuff, right? And they love to hype big storms, you know, crazy. And, and especially snow. But before I get on that, let me just show you the TV weather people th that have degrees. And these people have degrees from the University of Washington. You, you can all be proud of, right? You know, I, you know, I've had a lot of these people in my class, okay? Like Jeff, Jeff Renner, MJ McDermott, Ch uh, Shan O'Donnell, right? These people have degrees from here. They know what they're talking about, okay? Rich Marriott. The weekend people, which I'm not gonna show here, a lot of them, <laughs> have a lesser background. Now, <laughs> hyping, one thing these TV stations can't help themselves about is hyping snow. They go crazy about this. And the king of hype is this guy, Jim Foreman. You know, they call him Danger Jim. They call him other, people call him other things. If there's like the one-tenth of a percent chance of snow, he's out there pointing at things. I mean, this is really amusing stuff. Uh, I invited him once to give a talk at the, uh, uh, the Puget Sound chapter of the American Meteorological Society, and strangely enough, he wouldn't come. <laughs> but anyway, he's more there for amusement. Now, the real serious place you, you, want, you go for weather information is online. Online has changed everything. You can get the latest forecasts online. You can get the raw information. Almost everything that professionals use, you can get online. The models, the data, the radar, it's all online. If I have, in fact, if I have time, I'll, I'll go online right here and show you. Um, you can look at the latest forecasts from the most up-to-date computer models. Uh, one thing I like, you could look at weather cams. There's, you know, there's cameras all over the place. You can scan those. But one thing I want to make, make clear is you, know, you can give yourself a lot of rope and hang yourself with the online stuff because there is stuff that, that on there that's deceiving and sometimes wrong, it looks so compelling. So you gotta be careful, you know, so this is like safe weather observing. A really good place to start is the National Weather Service. They have, they, if you just search on Google, National Weather Service, Seattle or something, and you'll get it up right away. I mean, they, their forecasts are, are very reasonable. Um, the, the official warnings are available there. They have links to get satellite and radar data uh, you can see, you know, there's a forecast out in time. So it, it's a really good place to start. Um, one of the things I like, sort of an inside baseball thing for weather, is they have something called the, wet, the, wet, the forecast discussion that's available on their website. Each forecaster, when they make a forecast, they write up what's in their mind, what they think is happening, what's the uncertainties in the forecast. You can go to that weather discussion and read it yourself. It's actually, you know, it's not that difficult. You know, you can't read it here, but this is an example of one of these forecast discussions. You know, you know, low clouds are likely to push into the coast tonight, probably down the strait. Harder to say whether there'll be morning stratus in the interior. So you can put yourself in the mindset of the forecaster and see what the uncertainties are. Forecast, if you're really into this weather stuff, this is a good place to go, okay? Now, now, now a little bit of dirty laundry or some kind of laundry. Um, where do you get the best forecast? It turns out that the Weather Service doesn't provide the best forecast. Actually, some other people do, or other groups. Weather.com has very good forecasts, and objective measures show they're better than the Weather Service. Okay? And you, know, you can go Weather.com online. You could do it. You can get your app. I have, I have the Weather.com app myself. But they were just bought by uh, IBM, by the way. You may have heard about that. Now, why are they better? Well, they start with the same models and observations that the Weather Service uses, but they use extremely sophisticated statistical post-processing. They use all the data and they combine it statistically in an optimal way to give better forecasts. 
By the way, if you ever want to see who, where the best forecasts are, I don't know if you've ever seen this website, forecastadvisor.com, okay? You can go to this place and you can type in any city in the country, forecastadvisor.com, and they will tell you for the last year or the last month who had the best forecast. That's kind of interesting information. And, you know, you'll see, you know, the Medio Group, their number, you know, this uh, Forica, that was, that, that's a private sector firm. The Medio Group is another one. The Weather Channel, okay, 78%. Then the Weather Underground. And you go down, the Weather Service is, you know, a little bit down that way, okay? Last month, this is really embarrassing for the Weather Service, uh, their, their, their per, uh, percent correct was 69.58%. Per persistence was better than they were. Persistence is like a no-brain forecast. That's forecasting today what happened yesterday. <laughs> so I may save this to tease my friends in the weather service, but <laughs> that, that ain't good. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Now, one thing I want to stress, the world has changed in the last five or 10 years, and that's smartphones. You know, back in the 80s and 90s, we dreamed of the perfect weather forecast delivery tool, the tool that would have graphics, that would know where you were, that had pretty good bandwidth to communicate information, right? You know, had smarts, you know, has all kinds of, you know, computing capabilities. And all of a sudden, we got it, right? Smartphones. They are the, absolutely the best way to deliver weather information to you, personal, what you need. And so there are a number of smartphone apps that are out there that, that, are, that are out there. And, you know, one of my favorites, okay, I, you know, yeah, I like the Weather Channel. I like, obviously. The, uh, the, we the Weather Channel has an app that gives you the latest forecast. I don't know, 17 degrees. I don't know where they got that from. But <laughs> anyway, and they've actually added something very sophisticated. They will actually give you a short-term forecast based upon the local radar to tell you where the rain's going to hit in the next hour or two. They got that built in now as well. So if you could have one app, this is a pretty good app, okay? I'd, I'd, I'd recommend it. Um, now, professionals like myself, we like to look at the weather radar on the time, over, all the time, right? To see where it's raining and where it's moving. And there's, a, there's one we really love. It's called Radar Scope. I think it costs $10 a year or something. But it's great. We'll talk about radar more later. Uh, there are others. You may have heard of Dark Sky. There's another one that, that tells you whether it's going to rain the next hour or two based upon extrapolation of radar imagery. So there's a whole collection of these apps. Some are good, some are bad. Uh, the most, again, the most, uh, for a general weather app, that weather.com one's pretty good, okay? Well, one thing I want to talk about is weather radar, okay? And I'm going to tell you that being able to look at weather radar can change your life. I mean, really change your life. I'm not kidding about this. It can alter your life. It can help you plan outdoor recreation. If you want to know whether it's going to rain the next hour, okay, or where to go, Weather radar can solve your problems. And since the Kameno weather radar, the closest weather radar to us here in Seattle is at Kameno Island. And they put it in the place in the early 90s. And you know, since that radar went in, I rarely get very wet when I bicycle. I bike every day. And I used to get wet all the time. Sometimes a really heavy rain would hit me and I'd be drenched. And I almost never get really wet anymore. And that's because of weather radar, okay? And with a little knowledge, you can keep dry, too. I mean, here's an example of a weather radar image. Now, you see these on TV, right? And, uh, you know, you have these colors, and then they have these numbers on the side. This is a typical weather radar image. So let me tell you, let me do a little bit of weather radar 101. And I'm authorized to do that because I do teach 101 here, so it's okay. Weather radars tell you where precipitation is falling. That's what it tells you. It also can tell you the intensity of the rainfall. Okay, so that's what radar does for you. Or it can pick up snow as well. Doppler radars also can look at velocities. They can tell you how things are moving. And radar can be used to track storms and fronts and all kinds of stuff. And it's a real important tool. So we have the National Weather Service has put radars all over the country. And you know we got coverage. In fact, we got a new radar here uh, a few years ago, which a lot of us were working on, right? the Langley Hill radar on the coast, but the closest radar to us here in Seattle is Camino Island. Radar, the eastern coast, the United States is great coverage, right? There's some gaps in the west, and that's due to blockage by the terrain. So, okay, 
So most of the radar images you see online, on TV, have a lot in common. And basically, they're showing you precipitation intensity. And, the, and the, you see those numbers there, 5, 10, 45, 50. That is the intensity. Intensity is increasing as we go down this way, OK? The units of that are something that you don't have to know about. It's called DBZs, the decibels and reflectivity. So I won't ask you that later. And there's a color code. And I want to tell you the color code so you know what to do. If it's gray, 5 or 10, light drizzle, you, you know, a little bit of, you know, you would, I wouldn't even worry about it. I'll bike in that any, any day. Um, then you get to like, you know, you know, 15 or 20 into the little light reds. That's light rain. I'll get you got your Gore-Tex on, you're probably okay, okay? Then you start getting to 30 and 35, the greens, that's getting to be, you know, moderate rain. Okay? It's getting to be a little bit more problematic. You start in getting to 40 and 45, that is pouring. <laughs> I don't bike in yellow, okay? Forget that. And then as you get into reds, well, <laughs> forget it. <laughs> that is either absolutely torrential rain or it's hail, one or the other, okay? So you probably don't want to go, reds you don't want to go out in, yellows you probably, but greens you might think about, okay? So the other thing I want you to keep in mind, around here we have mountains, and so the radar gets blocked by the mountains, okay? You've got to keep that in mind. And also the time of these radars are often given in GMT or UTC, okay? Universal time, that's Pacific Standard Time plus eight hours. Meteorologists, we all use the same time. We don't use standard, Pacific Standard Time. We use UTC or GMT, which are the same thing, the local standard time of Greenwich, England. Okay, so here's your important precipitation information. And this is why you can stay dry. Even on rainy days, the precipitation is rarely uniform. There's heavier and lighter rain, right? And you can look at the radar, you can look at the animation of the radar, and you can see where it's light, where it's heavy, how it's moving. And so you can decide when to go. And if you can shift your timing, 10 or 15 minutes, you can often miss the heavy precipitation. It's really amazing how much you can do. 30 to 60 minute shift, you can almost always do it. So if you're biking or you're taking that walk, you do that shift, you can stay dry. And moving a few miles can make the difference between rain and no rain. Because we have a lot of differences around here. Let me give you an example. Okay, this is, a, this is an example of my decision about biking home. This is an image at 448. Uh, PM, and you know, you know the UW. I'm gonna see. I move this, and UW is over here someplace. Okay, I'll put my arrow, and it is pouring. I ain't gonna get on that bike. Okay, but if there's an, uh, I can't. I'm not showing you an animation, but this thing was moving through. If I waited to 5:40, oh, oh, the back of the line gets through. I can go home absolutely dry. And if you look at an animation either on your smartphone or online, you can see the precipitation moving through. You can time it. Okay? It's, it's amazing. Now let me tell you about some different situations. This is a consumer class here. After the, a lot of times rain is pretty steady with fronts. But after the fronts go through, we often get into the famous shower and sun breaks. Right? That's a real characteristic of, of, of Northwest weather. After fronts go through, you'll have showers, it's raining pretty hard, then there's a break and the sun comes out, right? Everybody knows this, right? You've been in this? Some people think the weather here is weird. It's not. It's that way because the Pacific Ocean produces that. When, when you have cold air from Siberia and Alaska going over the warm water, you tend to go unstable and get these showers and sun breaks. So there's the showers and sun breaks. This is a visible satellite picture. Do you see that? Do you see there's some black areas and white areas? That's the showers and sun breaks. Well, if you want to go outside, you don't go out in the shower, right? And so here's an example of a radar image from one of these shower and sunbreak periods, okay? And here we are in Seattle right there, and you can see where we are. And you see these coming in. You just time yourself so you don't go in the heavy rain. If it's heavy rain, you go inside. So you can stay dry. Um, probably the most difficult time to stay dry here is when there's a big, broad Pacific front, and particularly something called an atmospheric river. Sometimes that's called the Pineapple Express. You ever hear the Pineapple Express? That's when you get this, this plume of moisture coming in. There you can have very steady, moderate rain for hours. That's bad news. And this, this radar image here shows an example. Do you see all those yellows and greens there? No gaps. Bad news. 
Okay. Now, what is the number one weather phenomenon, local weather feature here in central Puget Sound? It's the Puget Sound Convergence Zone. And if you know its ways, you can stay dry. Now, this is a satellite picture of a Puget Sound Convergence Zone. This is a visible satellite picture. And I don't know if you can see here. Let me if I can see that we're right over here, okay? And the Olympics are over here. Now, what happens is when fronts go by, the winds often become westerly or northwesterly. The air goes around the Olympics and then converges over Puget Sound. When the air converges together, it's forced to rise. The air force to rise produces clouds and precipitation. Okay, do you see that you have this very narrow zone of clouds? But amazingly, there's clear places to the north and south. During convergence zones, you have a very narrow, few mile wide area of precipitation which loves to be over North Seattle, unfortunately. <laughs> but if you go south or north, you can be in sun. It could be 10 degrees warmer in bright sun. You can, look at, you can look at a satellite picture that's online, or you could look at a radar, and you can see this. And here's a radar of a Puget Sound convergence zone situation. You see the band of precipitation sort of east-west? That's what the convergence zone looks like. So when that happens, you can get out. Now here's another question. Where do you go for dry weather during the winter around here, right? That's a big issue for all, all Northwest residents. Well, you go for the rain shadow. People think about rain here a lot, but just as important about Northwest weather is the fact we have rain shadows. And here is my, this is from my book. You, you wanna, you, you, this, this is a figure from the book. Uh, if you have air approaching a mountain barrier, when it goes up, you get clouds and precipitation, right? Air is forced to rise, it cools, it becomes saturated, you get clouds, precipitation falls out. But then as it sinks down the other side, the opposite happens. The air is compressed and warmed, the clouds evaporate. That, the right side, is the rain shadow, okay? You want to be dry, that's where you want to be. And around here, you know, we got a lot of rain shadow action around here in the Northwest. Um, for instance, the, during the winter time, the winds tend to be from the Southwest. And so the air approaches the Olympic Mountains on one side. You get huge amount of precipitation on the southwest side. And you've got the whole river valley there. You get places that get 150, 170 inches of rain a year. You don't want to go there. <laughs> Vampires like those areas. <laughs> so if you're a vampire, that's where you head. But on the other hand, as this air sinks on the other side, and you get into the rain shadow that tends, tends to be around Port Townsend and Squim. Squim is well known for that. Squim, which is, you know, you can see it uh, over there in the northwest, of, on, the northwest uh, on the northeast side of the Olympics, they get about 15 inches of rain a year. They get about the same rain a year as Los Angeles. So you can have Los Angeles rainfall here in Seattle. Isn't that amazing? And here's a radar. You can tell it's happening. Here's a weather radar from the Camino Island radar. And, you know, can you see that hole over there? That's what the rain shadow looks like. You want outdoor rec rec a recreation on one of these days, it's pouring in Seattle or it's raining in Seattle. You get, on, you get your bike, you put it on your car, uh, or you get your golf clubs, and you run up there to swim, okay? So, I mean, you know, there it is. Olympic rain shadow, okay? 16 hours. Port Townsend is dry. I mean, there's a reason a lot of people like to retire and swim in Port Townsend, you know? There's a reason. It's because the place is really dry. Um, but you don't have to wait till retirement, right? You can go there now and, 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 en and en enjoy. And in fact, uh, th I, I, this is kind of funny. The Huffing Huffington Post uh, talked about the best places to retire, and Squim was number one. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's much cheaper in Los Angeles, no smog, same precipitation. Uh, number two, though, was a nudist resort in Edinburgh. <laughs> but that's something I'm not going to touch in this talk. <laughs> Um, weather, the, one of the key issues about the weather around here is the local weather. I mean, we have a tremendous diversity of weather going on simultaneously around here, and that's produced by the terrain and the land water contrast, and I told you about a few of them. So the weather here can vary tremendously off over short distances. It could be the rain shadow or not in the rain shadow, but even on a clear night in the wintertime, Things can really differ around here. And a big reason is the fact we have wa water versus land, right? Water tends to moderate the temperatures. 
It tends to keep it warmer in the winter, and, and it tends to be cooler during the summertime. So just whether you're near the water or away from water can have a huge impact on the, the weather that you're experiencing. Um, so a lot of times TV stations, they talk about the weather at SeaTac Airport. Well, the weather can be hugely different than SeaTac Airport. Let me give you an example. Um, I had some students who were taking 101. I gave them all weather sensors, and they drove around the city. This is between uh, 6 a.m. and 7.30 a.m., I think some November morning. And I don't know if you can see this, but this shows you the temperatures at that time. And if you look carefully, you'll see along the water there, Seattle is 40 degrees. All over the, uh, the water there on the, uh, the lake, uh, on the Lake Washington bridges is 40 degrees. But if you go inland, away from the water, I can see a 20, 27 over there. In fact, there's one down there that's 25.6. So we're talking about a 15 degree difference in temperature on a typical calm, clear winter night. And it all depends upon whether you're near water or away from water. Another thing that helps warm things up near the city is a little bit of the urban heat island effect, the, the, the heat that's being released by the city. During the summer, it's just the opposite. Um, here's the, this is temperatures on some summer day. And I don't know if you, look, if you look carefully, you'll see along the Puget Sound area, 66 and 69. Okay, this was, this was, this was like the highest temperature of the day. But you go here, the U District, it's 82. So you can pick your weather. In the summer, you want to be, if it's really hot, you just go to the water, right? So, you, know, you can't do that in all, all parts of the country. It's good. I want to tell you a little, thing, a little more I want to tell you about temperature. When you see air temperature reported on TV and the radio, this is the temperature that's measured at two meters, roughly six feet above the, okay? So whenever you see the temperature, when Jeff Renner in his deep baritone voice says, you know, the temperature at SeaTac is, you know, is 50 degrees, that's at about two meters. That's the official height, okay? And one thing I wanted you to know is the temperature at two meters can be radically different than the temperature at the ground. And you, and you never should forget that. On cold, clear nights, the ground is often two to five degrees colder than the air temperature. And so even the air temperature reported could be 35, but that ground could be freezing. It could be frost, okay? And so that's really important. What do you think is the number one weather killer here in the Northwest? Floods? Windstorms? No, you're shaking your head, that's good. It's, black, it's ice on roadways. That's the big weather killer around here, you know? So it's amazing how many people get injured and killed by, that, by this. And so the thing, so, so one thing you gotta consider, if, the, if you're, you're, a lot of people have thermometers in your car, right? Or you, if, if the temperature is 35, it's a clear night, you better watch out because you could be freezing down there. Another thing to keep in mind is that bridges freeze up first. So the reason is air is a good insulator. So these cold, clear nights where the, where the ground is radiating heat to space, the bridge can cool down below freezing first. So a lot of times the biggest dangers on bridges or overpasses first. And if you really want to worry about it, and we're coming to the, to the ice part of the year right now. This is the most dangerous part of the year right now. When you see fog on one of these cold nights, that's really dangerous. Because if you have fog, which is water droplets, and that goes over the cold roadway, those water droplets can freeze quickly and with a lot of ice. So anyway, that's, that's your safety message for today. Okay, and I don't want to be overdramatic, but it's real. I, I do some forensic consulting on the side, and the number one thing people, the lawyers call about, the number one thing there's weather lawsuits is about ice on roadways. That's what's killing people. Um, here's another consumer thing I wanted to mention. What, what, when you hit the term probability of precipitation, what does that mean? There's been all kinds of surveys, and it turns out a lot of people don't know what it means. Okay, here it is. Here's your, here's your quiz for today, okay? I won't grade you, but you'll have to, you can self-grade. Okay, 20% chance of rain means it will rain over 20% of the area, 20% of the time, or 20% chance will rain at a specific point over some period? Three. God, you guys are good. <laughs> and that's the correct answer. But a very significant number of percentage of the people don't know the answer to that. So here's another consumer thing. 
How long into the future can we skillfully forecast the weather? Well, things have changed. They've gotten a lot better, by the way. Um, first, the ability to forecast decreases. Our skill decreases with time. Our forecasts now are extremely good at one to two days out. I mean, really good. There's excellent skill three or four days out. It starts fading at five or six days out, but there's still some skill. But when you get more than like eight, nine days, you know, the skill really drops to a point that it's not that useful anymore. And you know, by the way, and this, this can depend on the situation. Some situations are more skillful than others. But an exciting thing is we're starting to gain skill the second week. 10 years ago, we had no skill the second week. Now we do. And so we were starting to see events. And a good example of that that was in the press is Superstorm Sandy. Remember Sandy that hit the East Coast? The European Center model was predicting it quite accurately eight days ahead of time. Okay? So, and we're seeing that more and more. One thing I want to tell you is that you know, the, I wanted to hit hard that forecasts have uncertainty to them. You know, we use computer models. What is the technology we use for forecasting? We use computer models. And these models are not perfect. We have to start with a description of the atmosphere. It's called the initialization. It depends on observations. But observations are not perfect. They have errors. They're not everywhere we need it. We can't create a perfect description of what the atmosphere is like. And then our models are uncertain. We have errors and we have things that we're not sure about in the models. So all weather forecasts are uncertain. And these uncertainties increase in time. Okay? And this is something we're not communicating well. And many public forecasts provide little information about this uncertainty. Now, this is from, I don't want to pick on King 5 TV, but like this is ridiculous. You go to the, on, on air or you watch it, you see this kind of thing, right? It's King 5, they'll give you the five day forecast and they'll give you five more days, okay? Because it's King 5, right? <laughs> and on day nine, the high temperature is 47 degrees and the low is 33. What do you think the chances are that it'll be exactly 47 or exactly 33? Not much, okay? The uncertainty increases with time. We should never be giving forecasts this way. We should be giving ranges of temperatures. We should be giving probabilities. That's what we really should be giving you. And strangely enough, and by the, by the way, the Weather Service does the same thing. I don't want to pick on King 5 TV. Okay? Here's the weather service, they do the same thing. The only thing they show probabilities for these days is precipitation. Now here's the good news. My profession is rapidly developing the technology to provide uncertainty information about their forecasts, to give you probabilities. And this technology is called ensemble forecasting. You know, it, traditionally, we would have one computer simulation. We only had enough computer power to do one forecast. We have so much computer power now, we can run not one forecast, but 50 forecasts, 100 forecasts, each of them starting slightly differently, each using very, you know, physics that may be different, but, but very reasonable. So we can end up with 100 different forecasts. They're not identical. So if, let's say for rain, if half of them say it's going to rain, half of them say it's no rain, well, 50%, right? But we can do this for any parameter, temperature, humidity, wind. We can give you probabilities for everything. In fact, we can do even better than I'm saying because we can use all kinds of statistics to improve things. So we are, in the next 10, 20 years, we're going to be really pushing this probabilistic forecasting out there. And the question is whether consumers like you are well ready to use it. That's an interesting question. So finally, you know, I want to end with a little bit of uh, some fun stuff about reading the sky. Okay. You gotta be a good observer, right? Half the fun of weather is reading the sky. And I just wanna show you a few, a few clouds and what they tell you. Well, you know, there's a typical progression of clouds when storms come in. Uh, often, the first thing you see are these high, wispy ice clouds called cirrus. You can see the ice crystals falling out. That's often the first sign of bad weather coming in. And then as the cirrus clouds thicken up, you often get what's, what we call a cirrostratus layer, cirrostratus. And often that's indicated by a halo around the sun. So when you see this halo, it's a 20 degree halo around the sun, that's telling you that, some, that something's coming in. Then the clouds lower, 
and we get a cloud that's very popular around here called Alto Stratus. And it's also called the watery sun cloud. You can just barely see the sun through there, okay? You see that, you know, you know, this thing's coming in. And then finally, there's Nimbostratus, where you see where it's, you know, the, it's starting to rain. And often when it starts, the rain is about to start, you start losing the definition of the lower clouds. They become fuzzed up. Now, often, you know, we see that progression as fronts come in. As they go by, you'll often see this progression. You'll often, the air becomes unstable, and you start seeing these cumulus clouds popping up. You'll have the sun breaks and clouds and, and precipitation, and you see these kind of clouds, cumulus and even some cumulonimbus over here after the front. That's a typical progression. It tends not to be steady. Um, one cloud that we see around here a lot that often tells us when, when the weather system is starting to come in, we start getting lift, we start getting moisture, and often the first thing you see are these mountain clouds that look like lenses. These are lenticular clouds or mountain wave clouds. Isn't this beautiful? You know? Sometimes they're stacked in plates. Okay, these are called the lenticular cloud. And what do they look like? Flying saucers. <laughs> and we can be proud that the flying saucer craze started here in the Northwest. <laughs> did you know that? You know, did you know that the whole UFO thing started here? Back in 1947, uh, a pilot flying between Yakima and the west side saw these strange clouds, and he thought they were, uh, they, they, they were calling these, and they were moving quickly, the wind, winds were cha changing, and he claimed, or at least the media thought, that these were flying saucers, alien presence, okay? So, it's kind of interesting, so I'll leave that. Now, so one thing, you know, we're getting to holiday time, and people are looking for the perfect gift, right? <laughs> so one question, okay, so th this, is the, the, this is the consumer purchasing part of, the, uh, part of the talk. I'll tell you how you can spend your money. Well, one nice thing is that weather instruments are really a fun thing to have around the house, you know? It really is. I mean, I, 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 and you can spend as much money as you want you can buy a rain gauge for 20 bucks. That, that'll be fine, okay? And you can measure the rain in your house and keep track of what's going on. Um, you can get relatively inexpensive thermometers that are not bad for like $20, these electronic ones, so that, that's pretty good. Uh, but if you're a real serious person about this, you can buy a home weather station. And some of these are almost professional quality. And I mean, here's an example of one. Um, I mean, you can buy ones pretty cheap at Costco for $50 to $100. Um, if you want to spend like $500 to get something really good, the uh, Davis Vantage Pro series, a company called Dave, Davis Vantage Pro, that's very good stuff. But you've got to spend like $500. And you can interface this with your computer and you can to show it. You can, and some people actually make it available to others. Hundreds of thousands of people in this country are putting their weather, forecast, weather uh, data online. And there's various services, the Weather Underground and others, that allow you to put your weather. And so you can, you, can, you can go to like the Weather Underground or some of these other sites, and you can see weather observations from your area from people that are collecting it through their homemade weather, their, their home purchased weather instruments. So anyway, it's, you can spend as much money as you want, okay? You can spend, you know, $10 or $20, you can spend $500. You can spend more if you, if you want. Well, by the way, one thing I should mention, um, you may not know this, but a lot of smartphones have pressure sensors in them. <laughs> you know that? There's barometers. In, in a lot, the iPhone 6 and the Samsung uh, Galaxy series have pressure sensors in them. And, and in fact, I, I have a project trying to use that data for weather forecasting. OK. Anyway, well, I'm going to end with the book, because these people from the bookstore came here, so I figured I'd throw this in. Um, I wrote a weather book on, on Northwest weather, and uh, it, it's sort of a comprehensive book on the local weather, and if you're interested, I think they'll be happy to sell you one, and I'm happy to sign them if anybody wants it, okay? So I think I'm going to end right there, and then open it up to questions, okay? <laughs>